This week in Flying Through Time, we'll be looking at the development of the U.S. medium attack aircraft from the pre-World War II models to their developments in jet-powered light bombers. These planes fill the gap between the fast, incisive action of the fighter and the lumbering, concentrated firepower of the heavy bombers. With the first use of planes during the Great War, the role of the aircraft in modern warfare quickly developed from the original airborne viewing platforms to dropping handheld grenades and then subsequently a bombing roll. While the initial attempts proved to be vastly less than accurate, the effect on the enemy morale and fighting capacity proved worth pursuing. The U.S. light bomber or attack role was filled by a number of aircraft during World War II. Three of the most notable were planes conceived before 1940. The Douglas DB-7 Boston A-20 Havoc was one of the most popular and effective light bombers of the Second World War. A total of 7,478 of these bombers were built and they served with the French under the designation DB-7 with the U.S. Air Force as the A-20 and with the RAF, RAAF and SAAF under the designation Boston. Although it never achieved the degree of public fame attained by some of its contemporaries, it was one of the most important types of twin-engine light bombers of the era and was operated by American, Australian, Brazilian, British, Canadian, Dutch, French, Russian and South African crews. It had a good performance and had excellent handling characteristics. Many of its features should be considered as being advanced for its time, such as a tricycle undercarriage and a two-compartment bomb bay. The A-20 was used extensively in the close air support role during the D-Day landings in Europe and more than proved its worth in the subsequent military battles that followed. The A-20A initially entered service with the U.S. Air Force in mid-1941, but by the end of 1944, most bomber groups had converted to the newer A-26 invaders. In the autumn of 1940, Douglas began a preliminary design study to develop a single successor to the current Douglas A-20, Martin B-26 and North American B-25 bombers, none of which had yet entered service with the U.S. Army Air Corps. The Martin B-26 Marauder was one of the most controversial American combat aircraft of the Second World War. It was primarily used in Europe and was in fact numerically the most important U.S. Air Force medium bomber used in that theater of action. The Marauder, however, suffered very high losses in non-combat related accidents. After extensive inquiries, it was concluded that there was nothing intrinsically wrong with the B-26 and therefore no reason why it should be discontinued. The problems were traced to the inexperience of both air and ground crews and also to the overloading of the aircraft without upgrades in power plants. As a precursor of things to come, this was one of the first planes to require specific intensive training. Many of the B-26 instructors had little experience in the Marauder and were almost as green as the pilots they were trying to train. Consequently, they couldn't teach the specific techniques associated to the plane to their students. The Marauder went on to survive all attempts to remove it from service and became an exceptionally notable aircraft.
The Doolittle Tokyo raid was perhaps the most famous exploit of the B-25 Mitchell. It was carried out in an attempt to shore up morale on the home front during the early months of 1942. The country's confidence had taken a battering after the crushing blow of Pearl Harbor and defeat after defeat having been suffered in the Pacific. The only two aircraft able to be used at the time were the Martin B-26 Marauder and the North American B-25 Mitchell. As the attack would have to be launched from carriers, the B-25 was selected on the basis of its superior takeoff performance. On April the 18th, 1942, Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle's plane took off from the carrier Hornet, followed by the 15 others. They headed for Japan, which was over 700 miles away. The Mitchells successfully bombed targets in Kobe, Yokohama and Nagoya as well as Tokyo and no aircraft were lost over the target. However, all 16 B-25s that took part in the mission were lost. Seven men were injured and three were killed. Doolittle at first told his crews that he thought the mission had been a total failure. Although the aircraft were lost and the damage inflicted during the raid was minimal, the operation provided an immeasurable boost to American morale. The raid also made significant differences in the Pacific. So as to deter future raids, four first-line fighter groups were retained in Japan rather than being sent into the Pacific arenas where they were urgently needed. As the Pacific campaign dragged on, some adaptions were made to light bombers that proved very effective. Due to the shortage of A-20s in Australia and in the entire South Pacific, some RAAF B-25s were modified into strafers and used to attack Japanese shipping. The bombardier position was removed and replaced with a package of four fixed half-inch machine guns. In addition, Four more fixed half-inch machine guns were installed in individual external blisters, two on each side of the fuselage. The Strafer B-25s proved especially effective in the role. In one attack in Rabaul, using skip bombing techniques to attack the ship's broadside, the fire from the eight forward firing machine guns prevented any effective return fire. Out of the original convoy of eight destroyers and eight cargo vessels that had departed Rabaul, all the transports and four of the destroyers were sunk or beached. It wasn't until the advent of the solid-nosed B-25J that the power of the famous Townsville strafers was equal. Later adaptions of this concept were even to include a 75mm cannon. The new plane being developed to replace these outstanding aircraft by a team led by Edward Heinemann and Robert Donovan at Douglas had a family resemblance to their well-respected A-20 Havoc. It featured a mid-mounted wing with a laminar flow aerofoil and was to be powered by a pair of 2,000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney R-2877 air-cooled radials. The aircraft was to have a large internal bomb bay capable of carrying 4,000 pounds of bombs or two torpedoes and was to be fitted with external racks underneath the outer wings for additional ordnance. The crew of three consisted of pilot, navigator or bomb aimer who normally sat on a jump seat to the right of the pilot but also had a position in the transparent nose and defensive gunner sitting in a separate transparent compartment behind the bomb bay. The defensive armament was to be provided by a pair of remotely controlled dorsal and ventral turrets, each housing two half-inch machine guns and operated by the gunner.
The first flight of the XA-26 took place on July the 10th, 1942, with test pilot Ben O. Howard at the controls. The A-26B was the solid-nosed attack version of the Invader. The prototype of one particular version was fitted with an unglazed nose housing and a forward-firing 75mm cannon. The A-26C was essentially identical to the A-26B, but featured a transparent nose with two forward-firing half-inch machine guns on the starboard side. The bombardier sitting in the transparent nose allowed for more accurate bombing from medium altitudes. Dual controls were fitted to the cockpit, with the second pilot being able to move in flight into the transparent nose to act as the bombardier. The forward-firing armament of the early A-26B was found to be insufficient, especially in the Pacific theater. Beginning with the A-26B-50 production block, a new eight-gun nose was fitted and six internally mounted half-inch machine guns were mounted in the outer wing panels so that bombs or rockets could be carried underneath the wings. In reality, this would allow for an 18-gun forward barrage, truly a devastating onslaught. The invaders served exceptionally well throughout the closing stages of the Second World War to such an extent that when at the end of the war, when almost all other aircraft were deemed surplus and scrapped, the A-26s were retained in large quantities. The fate of the B-26 Marauder was not so grand. After the war in Europe was over, most of the Marauder-equipped units were quickly disbanded and their planes were scrapped. The retained invaders were soon put to use in the Korean conflict where the close ground support and attack capabilities were again called upon. Here they provided the containment required of the invading forces while the UN forces withdrew under the initial onslaught of the North Koreans. By this stage, they'd reverted to the B-26 naming of the bombing role. With the new technological leaps now being made in jet engines, an invader replacement was being conceived. The B-57 had its origin in the Korean War, which broke out on June the 25th, 1950. At that time, the only bombers that the U.S. Air Force could commit to battle were types that were left over from World War II. In particular, the only light bombers available were the sturdy Douglas B-26 invaders. The invader had proved to be the only bomber suited to the night interdiction role in Korea. Unfortunately, the invader was capable of visual-only operations and was available only in dwindling numbers. At the current attrition rate, it was projected that the B-26 fleet would be entirely gone by 1954. A modern replacement was urgently needed. In pursuit of a B-26 replacement on September the 16th, 1950, the U.S. Air Force issued a preliminary requirement for a light jet bomber with a service ceiling of 40,000 feet, a cruising speed of about 400 knots, a maximum speed of 550 knots, and a range of 1,000 nautical miles. It was decided that the winning candidate would have to be selected exclusively from a list of existing designs, since an entirely new design would add years to the development schedule. Designs that would be considered were the Martin XB-51, the North American B-45 Tornado, and the North American AG-1 Savage. In a rare move, foreign designs were also to be considered, namely the Avro Canada CF-100 and the English Electric Canberra. The North American B-45 missed the cut in this attack role, but went on to have a short but exemplary role as a light bomber. The Tornado was the first four-engine jet bomber to fly operationally for the U.S. Air Force. It was the first jet aircraft to be refueled in the air and was the first jet bomber to drop a nuclear weapon. 
For a few years during the early and mid-1950s, the B-45 tornado was a key element in the U.S. nuclear deterrent. It went on to serve in the U.S., England and Japan, and even saw operational service in the Korean War. The first models delivered were the bomber version, but the capability of the design for reconnaissance duties was immediately recognized. As the initial concepts for this plane began in the mid-1940s, the tornado was rapidly eclipsed in performance and capability by more advanced designs. The Avro Canada CF-100 was a new, heavy, long-range, all-weather interceptor that was nearing production status in Canada. But it was deemed to have too small a range and limited bomb load capacity. The Martin XB-51 was a large, three-jet bomber with two J-47 turbojets mounted on the lower forward side of the fuselage and a third J-47 in the tail. A variable incident swept wing was fitted, reminiscent of Vought's XF-HU-1 Crusader light attack aircraft, and for the first time, powered air brake and drag chute for landing. As a mark of the engineering daring of the time, the aircraft had a groundbreaking rotatable bomb bay door. Unfortunately, the weapons bay was too small to permit the carriage of the wide variety of ordnance in the U.S. arsenal. The XB-51 had the advantage of being highly maneuverable for its size, and it was fast. Nevertheless, its low loading factor of 3.67 Gs made it inadequate during tactical operations. Like the CF-100, the XB-51's range and endurance were considered to be too small to meet the night intruder mission requirements. For a while, the XB-51 appeared to be the front runner in the contest, but the English Electric Canberra, a twin-jet, three-seat bomber built in England, soon emerged as an important contender. The Martin B-57 Canberra was a rare example of a foreign-designed military aircraft being built under license by an American manufacturing company for use by the U.S. Armed Forces. It had been envisaged by the Royal Air Force that the new jet bomber was to be a mosquito replacement in the light bombing role. On March the 2nd, 1951, the Air Staff directed that the Air Material Command arrange for the domestic production of the Canberra. Since Martin had a considerable amount of experience with the XB-51, the Baltimore-based company was chosen to carry out the production of the Canberra. The spectacle of the first Patton aircraft arrived to much fanfare. The Air Force decreed that the B-57 was to go directly into production, with relatively few changes from the Canberra B Mark II RAF version as the Martin Model 272. It was anticipated that 50 planes a month would be delivered by Martin between November 1952 and October 1953. After some delays, the first B-57 was manufactured in 1953 and the Air Force had accepted a total of 403 B-57s before production ended in early 1957. During the mid-1950s, the B-26 equipped U.S. Air Force wings began to be re-equipped with jet-powered Martin B-57 and Douglas B-66 aircraft, and the invaders were removed from frontline service. However, during the 1960s, some B-26s continued to be used to develop counter-insurgency techniques and tactics. As a further mark of their abilities, the B-26 invaders were still in use in 1969 against guerrilla groups in South America. These outstanding workhorses were never really replaced, they eventually just wore out. Overall, the B-57 was not easy to fly. Initially, some teething problems appeared. Prior to modification of its control and stabilizer systems, even the B-57B model was actually uncontrollable if one of its two engines were to fail during takeoff or landing. The number of B-57 accidents was rather high, but the accident rate actually compared favorably with that of the B-47 and some other aircraft. 
The initial A model ran to 171 units, but the B57B units more reflected the interdiction roles that they were ordered for. The addition of the B-51's powered air brakes and a tandem seating arrangement rather than the original pilot and navigator stations gave the plane more of the look of its fighter options. Though the black smoke from its cartridge starter still took new ground crew unfamiliar with it by surprise. Significant upgrading of the bomb ordnance the addition of wing-mounted cannons and rockets also increased its abilities in the interdiction role. The B-57 continued to evolve over the years, even into a sailplane-style winged reconnaissance variant used in the same role as Lockheed's U-2. Operations with the final variant, the B-57G, continued until April 1972, when it was withdrawn from service in Vietnam and deactivated. Nevertheless, the B-57G was one of the first self-contained all-weather night interdiction bombers to serve with the U.S. Air Force, and the operations that it carried out in Vietnam provided lots of useful information on follow-on weapon systems. Interestingly, in 1960, the Pakistan Air Force was supplied with a number of B-57Bs and Cs. The surviving PAF B-57Bs continued to serve until 1985 when they were finally replaced by the first batch of US supplied F-16A Fighting Falcons. In flying through time, the need for this style of aircraft has proven itself many times over. In spite of the changes brought on by time and technology, the nature of battle either on land or sea has always required fast, tough and valiant planes in the roles of interdiction and close air support. <laughs>